Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. How you guys doing? How you guys doing? How you guys doing? How you guys doing? Happy, happy Tuesday. We're back with the legend of the ashes, the legendary rivalry between England and Australia. So we are from right to we are from see what's talk about. Very, very looking forward to this. They did play like a week's back, and you know Australia put the beats on England. Um, I was seeing like some videos talk about, you know, is England you know, in like a crisis or something like that. Look. I, I can't really you know elaborate explain on that because it's like I said I didn't I, it wasn't even on TV here so I couldn't really catch it but um like I said shout shout out to England for winning the Ashes but I don't think I've really I don't think I've really understood how deep and how important this rivalry is especially for both these countries like bragging rights are, are at, like bragging rights especially for Australia are, are, are at an all time high you know what I mean. You guys know cricket is one of like the biggest global sports in the world, except for the U.S. I think, or just in like in Europe and Asia. I mean, really like, you know, Europe, Asia, Australia, whatever. But um, very very looking for it. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into the video, man. The Legend of the Ashes. Oh Jesus Christ. Here we are on the eve of another Ashes series and it promises to be a fantastically competed for series between England and Australia. But now, what are the Ashes? Well, the term Ashes, the Ashes was first used after England lost to Australia for the first time on home soil in England. And that was in August 1882. We're turning the clock Jesus. back 135 years. And you can already tell by, I guess, 1880, I guess it was like, you know, during the 1882s, 1880s, whatever, you can already tell how big this was. You see people on top of buildings, you know what I mean? Crowds there. It seemed like, uh, you know, like the setup is damn near the same. Like, the setup is, is the same. So you guys know, like, cricket hasn't really, it, it has evolved, but at the same time, like, most of the stuff is still the same. Just like baseball, you know, stuff like that. I'm not, you know, like I said, I'm not comparing cricket to baseball. Two completely different things. And it was a significant defeat for England. It wasn't the first match between England and Australia. That was 1877, Damn. the first test match at the MCG. But this was significant because of what happened afterwards. Just check the scorecard from this memorable test match. It was a very low scoring match. Australia 63 all out in 80 overs. England replied with 101 all out. Fred Sporforth, the Australian picking up 7 for 46, the quickie. Australia in their second innings, 122 all out. And England, they were set a target of 85, were bowled out for 77 in 55 overs. WG Grace made 32 and Sporforth picked up 7 for 44. He picked up 14 for 90 in the match, but England lost that test match by just seven runs. Mm. Well, there was a gloom in English cricket, in English sport after this. The Sporting Times the day later wrote what was an obituary it was a supposed mythical obituary for english cricket and it read english cricket died at the oval on the 29th of august 1882 the body will be cremated and the ashes taken to australia damn that's tough <laughs> that's tough that's tough yeah um this was in the 1880s so now i mean yeah that's that was probably fine words back then. You know what I mean? That was some. That was disrespectful back then. You know what I mean? English cricket, which died at the Oval on 29th of August, 1882. The body will be cre cremated and the ashes taken to Australia. Jeez. That's fighting words right there back then. You know what I mean? They, you know... <laughs> you know what I mean? They were not you want a hook. <laughs> That's fighting words. The words have remained ever since. The concept caught the imagination of the sporting public. At the end of the 1882 cricket season, Ivo Bly, who didn't play in that match at the Oval, was given the captaincy of England and he took an England side to Australia to play three tests and he vowed to return with the Okay, this was during like the eighteen eighties. I know like you guys probably can't really answer this, but like also, they have, you know, planes back then, 
you know. So I'm guessing they had to take what ships. You know what I mean? Like they couldn't take a train because obviously Australia's like its own continent, like surrounded by water and stuff like that. So I do find it interesting and questionable how. Like, how did these two teams play? You know what I mean? I mean, obviously, there's a, a way of transportation. I'm not, not, not trying to, you know, sound dumb or be like a smart ass or whatever, but like, you know, if they had, had to take like ships or boats, whatever, they was at sea for a good solid couple months. You know what I mean? And imagine making that trip just to get your ass beat. You know what I mean? That's that's embarrassing. You're at sea for, you know, all, all these months, like, you like you, you gotta get right. You gotta get right every time. Every time you gotta get right. The ashes. Now they were mythical. These ashes. The Australian counterpart Billy Murdoch would have none of that. He said they were going to defend them. What were the ashes? Well, during this 1882-83 uh, tour, England played a lot of social matches. One of them was at Christmas Eve. But I think they did have trains Rupert's back then, though. I think just outside Melbourne. Yeah, they and did. The game which England. Yeah, they did have trains back then. So one of they. That's the thing, like, you can't, you're not taking no, no train across the, the English Channel from, like, Britain, Britain and France, you know what I mean? Like, I doubt that, unless I'm, I'm missing something. So, that is, that is, that is interesting. I wonder how they, I mean, it had to be by boat, I'm sorry. I, I know I'm, I'm ranting on this, but it had to be by boat. Ship. One was a bit of a social affair. Captain Ivo Bly actually met his future wife, Florence Murphy, who, folklore tells us, presented him with an urn. Now, this is my own urn, but this is the size urn. of the urn where the ashes are now kept. Ooh. She presented him with this. Many people thought it was a perfume holder. It might well have been. Yeah. And it contained the ashes of the bales in that match on Christmas Eve that were burned and given to Captain Bly, and he kept it, and he regarded that as a present. Now then, he married the lovely Franz Murphy. They went back to England after England had won that series and that urn stayed on the mantelpiece at their family home in Rochester in Kent at Cobham Hall until Bly died in 1927 in uh, 43 years later. Now at his request, Florence's wife bequeathed that urn, and it's only this big, to the MCC and today, over 90 years on, this tiny, delicate and irreplaceable artifact resides in the MCC Museum at Lord's Cricket Ground in oh. London. In the 1990s, the England and Wales Cricket Board That's vintage. an urn-shaped Waterford crystal glass trophy. And the Ashes Trophy is what the modern teams play for now. It's crystal glass. And it was first presented to Mark Taylor after his team won the 98-99 Ashes against England. The urn has only twice been taken out of Lords. Once for the Australian Bicentenary celebrations in 1988 and secondly to accompany the Ashes series in 2006. So that thing never leaves. Not like <laughs> that thing never leaves. That thing stays where it's supposed to stay at. Like you ain't touching it. You ain't leaving it. That's supposed, that is supposed to stay where it's supposed to stay at. That's nice. That's nice. Seven. I don't know what the reason was for that. Mm. In terms of numbers, Australia and England have each won 32 times with five draws. It's absolutely level. But isn't it marvellous that in all these years, was, these obviously that's not right, though. cricket professionals are playing for yeah. a trophy about that size, the urn which contains the ashes that goes back to bygone years, to 1882. It's a wonderful story, but nothing comes bigger between England and Australia than the Ashes. Yeah, you can tell that's the, that that's it's yeah, this is big. Obviously, I guess I think there's like a three or four or five euro euro vi video. So obviously they was thirty two and thirty two winners. Now I'm not sure what it is now, but you know, like both teams as like I'm saying both teams compete when it comes to ashes. Like it ain't no joke. I mean, yeah, you know, Australia, you know, beat them pretty, you know, handily or whatever this time around. But, I mean, England, 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 they can get right. You know what I mean? They can get right. But I do want to go back to the scorecard, which is very, very interesting. 
So this is the only test to over an 18 82, 63 for 10, 101 for 10, 122 for 10, 77 for 10. And Australia won by seven runs. Which I'm guessing you just add, you know, just add the math up, whatever, you know what I mean? But um That's interesting. That is very, very interesting. Um uh, that's pretty that is a low scoring game. You know what I mean? That is. That's but uh, listen, it's like eighteen eighty two, you know what I mean? So like I haven't to be honest, I haven't even checked the scorecard from like the past, like you know, uh, Ashes. So I can't really, you know, explain on that. But the names Pete Barlow's, you know, I might even pronounce the uh, S, buddy, Blackham. Hey, but that's very, very interesting, though. And now I really understand how important the Ashes is to England and Australia. I mean, it's I like it. I like it. anyway. You guys will be like it. So come up later. Sauce reactions. We'll see you guys later.